I invite Dr. K R K R B for the or uh, the talk on role of high risk CABG in heart failure. It's a very important topic because heart failure is like the uh, Bermuda Triangle. We do not really know the data is scanty. There's a lot of data you heard before on medical therapy, but interventions we have stitches, we have cast, then uh, even PCI. data is very scanty the lot of observational data so uh, like with and uh, the, there is still confusion regarding whether to do uh, look for uh, viable myocardium or uh, like you can straight away revascularize so i invite dr k r balakrishnan who is the uh, the leading heart transplant surgeon in the country as well as a wonderful surgeon and wonderful human being so dr k r balakrishnan please as uh, dr abraham said it's a difficult topic to cover with uh, uh, large scale data because data actually don't exist role of cabg in heart failure and this topic is particularly relevant today even in this country because we now have several choices i mean a decade ago the number of choices for patients with severe heart failure and coronary artery disease was quite limited you could either revascularize them or perhaps try crt if it was indicated and otherwise uh, just leave them in medical treatment and uh, palliative care but now we have a lot more options apart from resynchronization therapy we also have options of mitral regurgitation mitral clips are getting more and more common place with good outcomes again the precise role of each of these modalities in the eventual treatment of a patient with heart failure needs to be further elucidated with more Uh, um, elegant studies and perhaps greater granularity, leading to a situation where patients with heart failure are treated in a separate or a specialized heart failure program, where all of these options are available, and then patients are those who are best suited for each procedure are chosen on the basis of heart core evidence. Dr. Gokhale spoke about transplant. Transplants are a reality in this country, and for the last decades, there are a lot of significant progress has been made. and mechanical circulatory support again is available uh, though it's still expensive uh, more than 150 uh, long term lvs i mean uh, implanted in this country with good outcomes so uh, this this discussion has great relevance from a practical point of view for a practicing cardiac physician and cardiac surgeon as to how to channelize these patients to, in, to towards each of these therapies no uh, probably i think it's covered there's, there's been a considerable progress in the last uh, a decade and these are the states in this country where organ donation exists and currently over 800 donations happen uh, because there are still challenges in transporting organ and stuff but we have uh, over the last decade we have done over 500 transplants all of which i think uh, close to 400 have been heart or heart lung so um, when you look at heart failure it can be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction and this is an important uh, distinction though Several times, patients with preserved ejection fraction progress on to those with reduced ejection fraction. Um, and the and the patients with reduced reduced ejection fraction can be acute or chronic. Again, your approach to these problems are very different because acute onset of uh, ventricular dysfunction uh, because of acute progression uh, of Uh, it's really a very different topic. Yeah, then you're talking about emergency CABGs or emergency revascularization and acute setting of myocardial infarction, and that perhaps is not quite what is meant in this topic. So I'll just give you a so decision regarding revascularization depends upon a lot of factors. Depends on the target vessels. It depends on the viability of the myocardium. Again, as Dr. Abraham mentioned, there is so much uh, literature on what is viability. What are the best tests for assessing viability? It depends on so many other factors. But there are associated mechanical lesions which are the primary reason for the heart failure and in which case treatment becomes uh, slightly easier in some contexts uh, the presence of right ventricular dysfunction and right heart failure is important because uh, i have not come across any evidence where revascularization improves right ventricular function primarily unless the right ventricular function is consequent to a high pa pressure which is con- consequent to high la pressure is consequent to ventricular dysfunction so presence of significant right heart failure uh, is also important in your uh, decision making and finally the, the whole world has recognized the importance of frailty and now we have much more scientific methods by which the frailty of a patient can be uh, objectively assessed including the strength of the hand grip 
and the uh, speed at which patients walk in. This has great relevance, not only in revascularization, not only in transplantation or LVAS, even in overall surgical procedures of the elderly where the frailty seems to have a great impact on the overall outcomes. I start with an example of uh, ventricular dysfunction of acute onset. This patient is recovering in our ICU right now. He had a very interesting uh, story, um, though tragic. He's a young man of 35. He presented uh, with an acute stroke to a hospital in Delhi, uh, uh, right hemiplegia. And the course of investigation for the right hemiplegia, acute uh, hemiplegia, they found a huge thrombus in the left ventricle. Uh, with uh, significant ventricular dysfunction. The thrombus was actually substantial in size and uh, seemed to be uh, quite mobile. Uh, I do not uh, envy the position of the uh, treating physician. It's hard to know what to do in terms of an acute stroke with a huge thrombus. So they elected to uh, operate on him. Uh, a ventricular resection, uh, aneurysm resection was done along with thrombus removal. And um, they could not, uh, and revascularization by three grafts. And the patient had severe biventricular dysfunction. And despite all attempts, including intraatic balloon pump, he had to be put on a mechanical cycle to support of ECMO. And after waiting for a week on ECMO and the ventricle showed no signs of improving, he was airlifted on an air ambulance to us. And after waiting for two weeks, uh, he underwent a transplant. The, even though the transplant was successful, in spite of the fact that we had no hemodynamic data on his underlying condition, with what was his PVR, whether his panel reactive antibodies were high or not. We were forced to do an emergency transplant. And the problem was not the cardiac function, but was the, the bleeding. Because he was in ECMO for three weeks with uh, so many other anticoagulants and the heart was stuck badly to the sternum, it took us almost uh, 14 hours to control the bleeding. Fortunately, he recovered. So this is one example of uh, and if this and this is the right thing to do because in most centers you would not proceed to a transplant just because the present patient presents with acute ventricular dysfunction because revascularization is the way to go. So uh, of the two, I think uh, the decision making is more complex in heart, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because uh, in the preserved ejection fraction by definition has an ejection fraction more than fifty percent. So the ventricular function. At least the systolic function is uh, well preserved. So in these patients, um, you are more likely to offer CABG if there's significant coronary artery disease. So the definition of FPF is well known, and uh, including echocardiographic criteria. Uh, and uh, there is, again, uh, I often had this confusion between what is diastolic dysfunction, what is diastolic heart failure, and what is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And those FPF is, of course, a condition where there is signs of uh, overt heart failure. And the number of PubMed citations over the last two decades, if you see, has been substantially increasing in, in this uh, particular condition. And approximately 50% of heart failure is those with preserved ejection fraction. And more than 50% of these patients have underlying myocardial ischemia. So I think revascularization, if it's identified in these patients, has, a, has an important role to play. And this is the single largest unmet need in cardiovascular medicine. Despite being strongly associated in heart failure with, with rigid and reduced ejection fractions, the high prevalence of CAD in FPF, uh, up to 35 to 50%. And uh, uh, when CAD is present, it is associated with greater risk of progressive LVF. And so, as I said, uh, these are not mutually exclusive compartments and one can progress uh, to the other. So uh, the findings of this paper from JAMA suggest that the prevalence of coronary artery disease is common in patients hospitalized as HEPPEV and may be unrecognized as making it a potential therapeutic target. And the incidence is roughly around 50%. Uh, the diagnosis, uh, the prognosis of HEPPEV has been compared with the reduced ejection fraction. They've been found to be as bad if not, or only marginally better. This was an important paper in the European Heart Journal of Heart Failure coronary artery disease in 10 year outcomes. And they found that the uh, mortality with reduced ejection fraction and HEPF are comparable. And the one year mortality, as you can see, is very considerable, up to 30% in some series. And uh, all the series comparing HEPF without CAD and with CAD have shown consistently poorer outcomes for patients with coronary artery disease, both in terms of sudden death and heart failure related death. Uh, with uh, uh, the risk of CV death increased by 31-fold in the first 30 days and 60% beyond one year. There is a role for revascularization in this segment. Therapeutic travels have uh, demonstrated effectiveness with a variety of drugs, but um, no drug drugs have made a significant impact. So you target the comorbidities, and of them, myocardial ischemia is the most important. CAD, so that's a treatable entity. 
And uh, survival after chondritic grafting, this paper demonstrated that HEFPEF and CAD patients with complete revascularization is associated with less deterioration in healthy function and lower mortality. So you can make a compelling case for revascularization if it's uh, diagnosed. So in patients with HEFPEF, uh, with uh, advanced symptoms of heart failure, maybe you could make out a case for uh, for investigating the coronary angiogram to rule out important coronary heart disease. Because every um, study has shown that revascularized patients with HEFPEF tend to do better and have a better survival as compared to uh, non revascularized patients, both in the setting of single vessel disease and multi vessel disease, and more both in the setting of low and high syntax score. Uh, and so, in conclusion, emerging data suggests the utility of CABG with complete revascularization in the subset of patients with heart failure with preserved interaction having obstructive coronary artery disease. This would be our conclusion. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful talk. And uh, my uh, approach to revascularization with the CBG or PCI is like this. If the person has heart failure and associated angina here, and of course, if you got a significant CAD, they have to be revascularized. One, if the patient has no angina, but significant uh, ischemia, then patient has to be revascularized. Suppose there is no angina, no ischemia, and uh, by by treadmill or even other stress thallium, etc., then becomes a little problematic. I would personally do a viability, even though the viability subsidy in stitch did not show any difference whether there was viable myocardium or not. Point number four is that I would opt for complete revascularization, especially in HEF-REF rather than incomplete revascularization. So that would be my approach. So other panelists and... Uh, yeah, Dr. Abraham, this is Dr. Ashish Nabar. HEF yeah. is obviously a diverse entity. I mean, you have obviously other etiologies in hef -PEF, And just because a coronary angiogram shows a critical disease, uh, that might merit revascularization on its own merit. But uh, but the other disease need to be diagnosed and taken care of. And there are infiltrative diseases and whatnot. So if it is if you are talking of hypertensive diabetic with HFPF and a coronary artery disease, all these statements are valid. But we should not miss on uh, other diagnosis that may be coexisting or the main cause of symptoms or failure. Oh, absolutely. But uh, if they have got angina or evidence of ischemia, then that also should that gets yes, yes. high priority. Certainly. See? If, if a patient has obvious angina, I think there is very little doubt in anyone's mind as to how you should proceed. And depending on the merit of the coronary angiogram, you probably revascularize them either percutaneously or with surgery. The problem areas, as I, I mean, I as the alluded to in this talk, are those without angina and where uh, there is scar tissue, but there is equivocal signs of ischemia with whatever test we have at our disposal, then how to proceed? That's that's the biggest conundrum and di di diagnostic dilemma that we face at this point in time. MRI, I think, has a great role based on how much scarring is there. If the scarring is limited and the contractile reserve is there, then I think uh, one... But I, I agree, but a lot of them are subjective, don't you? I mean, there is no yes. clear-cut guidelines because all of us face this every day, and especially we face it because we have a an option of transplant is also available. Yes. So yes. decision taking becomes even more difficult. When you don't have yes. another child, you probably jump in because a lot of our transplants are those who've had fairly recent coronary artery surgery done and did not work out. And the next three months, they come for a surgery. So this is no longer a theoretical discussion that we would have had 10 years ago in India, which is a very practical solution. I still don't have answers for that. Those are eye-opening comments. Yeah.